Sometimes you've got to confess. You know, it's part of it. You can be a Christian for 50 some years, but some days you just have to confess. And last night when we talked so much about atheists and what to say to them, um, without going into great detail, I have one who's very close to my heart. I thought until I started listening to, what was his name, David? Yeah. <laughs> and then Patrick. And I've been doing it all wrong. He's been in my midst for eight years. And the very first time he slammed my Jesus, I stuck my finger in his face. <laughs> I did. I shouldn't have done that. And I've sort of done it every since then. <laughs> now we get along okay. <laughs> but we don't talk about God. <laughs> we don't talk about religion. And we very seldom talk about social issues. Because we're so far apart. But then the more I listened to them talk last night. How awful is it that we who call ourselves Christians won't discuss the world with those who really need to know about the world. Those who really need to know what unconditional love is. I mean, I'm a big preacher on unconditional love. <laughs> but boy, did I get smacked in the face with it last night. Because even though I love this guy, maybe it's not unconditional. I mean, it, you know, I want him to have what I have. I want him to have what the rest of our family has, but he doesn't. And God told me last night and showed me last night through some very wise words of some people. I mean, David even looks like the guy I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. He looks like him. <laughs> We have got to be quiet and listen. And the words that come out of our mouth have to be love. And the things that come out of our heart have to be love. And the things that are in our brains need to be love. Instead of, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with him? <laughs> you know? And so I've spent... Probably more time than God wants to hear about it today, confessing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, eight years and I've done it so wrong. And I apologize to one of his halves today. And when I get the courage and I get the words, I will send him an inbox apologizing to him because that's the only way that him and I can talk about this at the present time. And I know that. I will apologize to him too. Because me and mine, <laughs> I haven't talked to them all about it yet, but they're hearing it now. <laughs> We've been doing it all wrong. We've been doing it all wrong. We cannot sit here and talk about love and not love everybody, no matter what they think. We can't do it. No. We've got to find a way to just be quiet and love them until they figure it out. Let God do it. Let God do it. So there's my confession. Vicki's not perfect. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I tell people, and I try to share this with as many people as I can, is the thing that you love about someone is also the thing that you hate. Okay, And I tell this to married couples all the time. It is the same thing that you love that is the thing that you hate. There are no exceptions. Okay, So like, if you're a messy person and you fell in love with your wife because she kind of picked up after you, well, after 30 years of living, after you, she's gonna, living with you, she's going to start fussing at you about not picking up. And you're going to start telling her to be more tolerant. Well, then you're squashing the very thing that you fell in love with. 
I was being generous. <laughs> okay, but, but that's a very important lesson. The thing that you love is the thing that you hate. And when you start squashing the thing that you hate, you start squashing the thing that you love. And you have to be so careful there. And that plays out over and over and over again. So Vicki, if you weren't the person that gets fired up, you wouldn't be the woman that I, I know and love. Okay? <laughs> so don't beat yourself up too bad about that. It's just... Uh, don't squash your good quality, which is getting fired up about what's not right, when you start working on what you see as, as what's bad there. So anyway, i got to share that because I say that to everybody as often as I can because we all do it. you know. Anyway, there you go. That's it. Um, I think now is a really good time because I think when you hear a confession and a testimony like that, you're thinking of somebody, aren't you? Let's, I'll, as, I'm going to pray for us. And as I do that, I want you to close your eyes and, and just picture that person. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, on my own behalf and on the behalf of the church and um, the way that we, we, we can be to people sometimes, Lord, I just want to uh, confess and say that we're sorry, Lord, but that we are open for your direction. As we think about these people, Lord, help us to see where the real hurts are. Help us to see those places in their heart where they've been wounded. And help us, like you were, to be a healer in the way that you've set us to do that, Lord. Lord, we thank you so much for your spirit, for your word, for your guidance, and for the unconditional love that you showed us every time we fail. Help us to represent that and help us to let that light shine for the people that are really close to us that we're, we're worried about and that we care about so much. Lord, I thank you for everybody on this roof tonight. And I thank you for all of the people that are being pictured right now, Lord. And if you could just help us to be quiet and listen to your direction about how to love them and how to take care of them and how to show them who you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to steal your music. Are you, you have another song? Okay. I'm going to steal. Can I steal that? Thank you. I grew up in the same kind of church that Patrick is from. And many of them are a cappella churches, which means we don't, they don't play uh, musical instruments. Patrick actually comes from an instrumental one, Church of Christ. So he did not secretly come and unplug the guitar. You know? We have other ways to try to secretly convert you, and that's not one of them. Um, you know, when, I, when you think about apologetics, a lot of times, um, I know when I got really serious about my faith and started studying everything I could get my hands on, I'd heard that term before and I thought it meant, hey, I'm supposed to just apologize for being a Christian. Like, it's my job to go and apologize for the Crusades or, or anything bad thing that any Christian had ever done to anybody. But when I got to studying it, like the word apologetics comes from the, uh, the word we get, like in, was it 1 Peter three fifteen? I think, uh, Peter says to always be reason, be ready to give a reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and godly fear. I'm getting directions, but I'm getting divine intervention. God told me to hold the mic up close to my face. <clears throat> Anyways, so, but, you know, and I hear that term, well, the word that when, when Peter Paul uses that, that word, apologia, means to give a defense of a position, a verbal plea and a defense. And I think about my kids. Anytime there's a confrontation and one of them wrongs the other one, I know one, I'm talking about other people's kids, actually, because one of mine's listening. But, but, you know, one of them wrongs the other one, and I say, hey, go apologize to your sister. And what do they do? They start to defend themselves. They start to defend it. Hey, this is why I did it. And they actually have a better definition of giving an apology than we do. We just want them to go say you're sorry, but that's not really giving an apology. Um, but if, if you're worried about, you know, like, like, if that's not really the way we should go about things, I mean, it's, it's talked about a lot in Scripture, actually. It's to, to be ready to answer these questions. Not for the people that necessarily don't believe, but people that need encouragement in their faith. And for me, for myself, it helps me with my doubt. So as we, we go into this, uh, this afternoon or evening, I'd like for you to just to, to hold that and think about that. That, you know, Paul was very adamant about giving a defense of the faith. Now, we're not Jesus' bodyguards. It can come across that way, too. Um, I think we've all fallen victim to that, like we were supposed to step in front of him and defend him. Uh, like Peter, you know, sometimes we want to be Peter when, we, when somebody says something about Jesus, we want to cut his ear off with a sword. And he picks it up and puts it back on. So, 
Um, but I'm gonna just I'm gonna take this time now to just bring Patrick up, and I'm gonna give it over to him. Is this too tall? Yes, it is. <laughs> all right, it's all green. Look at that. We're even live. How's that, lads? You, how how many Kentuckians does it take to get to make this work? Evidently, that we have now found out five. Yes, <laughs> lovely. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what what we said. I, I got in trouble at um, Oklahoma Christian University over this. I was asked to uh, to speak. I'll stand back here, shall I? Uh, I was asked to speak uh, on always be ready to give an answer out of Peter, and my response was your answer is Jesus. It's not your arguments. It's not a whole list of scientific proofs. Your answer is Jesus. I know whereof I speak. I work with atheists all the time. Here, Breton, Canada, all over. I was, I was in Toronto recently. Uh, you're surrounded by them. Many of them will look at me and they'll say, you know, we know what you believe. We were not there. We're having a hard time making that transition, you know, taking the, the journey from where we are to where you are, Patrick. What's your advice? And my advice to them is not, well, you need to read this book. My advice to them is, watch me. If you can find any other explanation for the way I treat you, and the way I share my goods, and the way I live my life, go with that. But if you can't, then we can talk about Jesus. Sometimes they just, Jesus doesn't need you to defend him. He needs you to illustrate him. Does that help? All right. That said, we're often asked the question, we, we did this in the last five minutes last night, so we're going to, do, uh, to rush into it tonight. People will say, well, Scientists don't believe, and they're smart, so why should we believe? And my response was, why do you care what scientists believe about God? They're not experts on God. They don't study God. They've not read the books about God. They've not dealt with it. It's rather like today as I uh, cross the, the very rusty bridge <laughs> to, to go back to my hotel, which Justin doesn't want me in the same state as your church, so... As I cross the Rusty Bridge and I get there, I have to stop because they're paving the road. Now, it's, it's raining, and I'm, I'm watching the way they're doing things, and I'm thinking, I'm not sure that's the way to do that, but I don't know anything about this, and they do. So I shall sit in my truck and just wait for someone to wave me on. I know a lot about if, if, if a car had hit them, and, and God forbid there'd been a brain injury... I would have been your guy. I could fix that, but can't fix a road. A man can be brilliant about quantum physics, about evolutionary paleontology, about geology, about any of these things, and not have a clue about God, but thinks he does. We've all met people who think they know how to do everything, and they don't. They absolutely don't. They know how to do one or two things, and they think that means that they can do everything. Spin, you know, tipping test tubes, spinning particle accelerators, chipping fossils, or thinking systematically about the fruits of such activities does not make you know anything about God. So, here are the things that they throw at us. And we'll do this briefly, then we'll go into uh, their, their comments about the Bible. They say Christianity discourages any attempt to understand the natural world. Uh, we're going to do four of these. We'll take them one at a time. It's not true, though. Christians love to examine and learn. They seek out knowledge. We have bookstores dedicated for Christian knowledge. We do not have very many bookstores dedicated to science knowledge. Why? Because scientists tend to get their narrow area and study that. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I don't really care if my heart surgeon knows about English literature. I don't. I want him to study hard. So I'm not, I'm not knocking scientists at all here. I, I am one. What I'm saying is this. Christians have a history of studying anything they can get. In fact, early scientists were almost exclusively Christian. If Christianity is so anti-knowledge, 
How did modern science arise in Christian universities? Which it did. Name a, name a scientific discipline. It arose in Christian universities. And yes, that does include Darwin. He went to a university that was started by and staffed by believers. That's where he got his knowledge. Now, while we won't agree with everywhere he went with it, it's obvious he got a good education in science from Christians. In fact, without Christianity, we wouldn't have Darwinism. He would have never known biology. Well, the second question that they ask is, well, then why don't scientists believe in God? That's an interesting question. Among scientists eminent enough to be um, included in the National Academy of Science, only 7% believe in a personal God. Among biologists, 5%. By the way, in, in, the Brit in British Isles, the UK, it's even worse. It's 3.3% believe in a personal God. Now, these factors are low. Uh, these figures are low by a factor of two or three, but that's still an awful lot of unbelief. First, we need to know something. This is a Western issue. In Singapore, a person with a doctorate is many times more likely to believe in God. In Japan, scientists, engineers, and college professors are far more likely to be believers than the common population. So the question isn't why are scientists less likely to believe in God. The question is, why do educated people in one culture accept Christianity while educated people in another culture reject it? If scientists refuse to believe for non-rational reasons, then their lack of faith is not due to reason. You understand what I mean? If scientists don't believe in God and you ask why and find out their reasons are silly, then why do you care what they believe? Here's the issue. Here's a quote. The, the modern university is not an agnostic toward religion. And in other words, doesn't not care about religion. It is actively hostile to it. To the point where Sam Harris, one of the new atheists whose books are immensely popular, wrote in his book, quote, some propositions, talking about beliefs, are so dangerous that it might even be ethical to kill people for believing them. Universities used to go, used to be where you went to open up your mind to great possibilities. In America and Britain, universities are where you go to get your mind shut down. And you are not allowed to, one of the first things you have to do when you go to a university now in, in America or in, in Europe, main, and mainly in British Isles, but also some in Europe, is to take a class and what you're allowed to say and what you're allowed not to say, what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Where it used to be, you went to college to do all the things you couldn't used to do because they, they, they turned you loose and let you think odd and weird things. No, not anymore. In fact, several universities and department heads have publicly lobbied for the right to take away PhDs from graduates who later turn to belief. By the way, if you're thinking... California and New York there, this, started, this movement started at the University of Iowa, Midwest. Consider the case of Richard Sternberg. He was the editor of a scientific paper that was published by the Smithsonian Institute. He published a peer-reviewed article by a prominent biologist about the Cambrian explosion. That's, um, that's an issue in evolution. The Cambrian explosion no life, no life, no life, bunch of life in the rocks. So he published this. The editor, who allowed this to be published, was shunned, lied about, and kept from doing research at the Smithsonian. Why? Because they found out Richard Sternberg believed in God. Hadn't, there were no errors in the paper. But they didn't want to publish a paper by a believer, even when it was accurate. Or the electronics and electricity writer for the um, Scientific American magazine was found to be a believer in creation. When, it found, when somebody found out on a post that he had made that he taught Bible classes, he was fired. Even though he never wrote about faith, he only wrote about electronics, he was fired. You're not allowed to work for Scientific American. You're not allowed to work for the Smithsonian. In fact, our universities have self-selected atheists. 
You cannot get your masters in many fields if they find out you believe. And without a master's, you cannot get to the doctorate level if they will not accept you if they find you believe. And if they find you believe while you're in, it doesn't matter if you're their best student. They're not going to award the doctorate. You have to get past the doctoral panel. They have to award it. And if one of their two or two of them say, no, you don't get it. I know far more people who are almost doctors than I know people who are doctors. They'll be all but dissertation, ABD is what it's called. And sometimes that means they were too lazy to write one. But a lot of times what it means is they were never able to craft a dissertation that was going to cross the board because the board found out they were believers. The reason most scientists in America don't believe in God is because you're not allowed to be a scientist in America if you do, through most, through most channels. I got my degrees overseas. They teach, it's amazing to me, universities teach the precepts of Marx, Engels, Comte, Freud, Haeckel, Nietzsche, Sartre, Skinner, Wells, Rorty, Said, even though each of these atheists have been proven to be quacks and frauds. Not harmless frauds either. Some of the things these people have said have killed millions and millions of people. And yet, those are still taught in universities. We're not allowed to speak in universities. Scientists know the score. They know what it takes, to what they're allowed to say to do their job. Now think about this for a minute. To develop a drug costs many millions of dollars, many, many years, and most of the drugs you develop will fail. Then some of those that succeed will later come back and bite you when you find that there's a problem you didn't know about, and now you're being sued. So that's why drugs cost so much. They just do. But there are other science jobs that cost so much, you're not going to pay for them. So what they have to do is work out grants with the government to get the government to tax you, get your money, and then give it to them. Well, the government's not going to give it to them if other scientists say they're not a real scientist. So you can't even get paid if you're a scientist and they find out you believe because your grants will get cut off. That's why, in case you ever wondered, why so many scientists don't believe. People will also talk about scientists being superior to others. Um, Scientists are the ones who invented things like, oh, let's say, um, the racial profiling and killing during the time before World War II. Americans don't know this. You need to know this. You need to know names like John D. Rockefeller, Carnegie, W.A. Plecker, who before World War II were actively going around the country sterilizing people against their will because they were not racially pure enough, breaking up marriages and sending one of the partner to jail because one race had married another, and taking people to um, institutions for the mentally insane because they fell in love with somebody from another race. That was in America. In fact, Hitler, we have the letters. Hitler wrote letters thanking the Rockefellers and Carnegies for the ideas for the Holocaust. That started here with scientists. I always, people say, I had, I've heard people say, Christianity has caused more death. And I look at them and say, are you insane? We're going to get to the numbers here in a bit. But the fact is, science helps us tremendously. I'm a big science fan, but it's not superior to faith. Faith gives life a lot more kindness and love than science does. Have you ever had a doctor sometime give you a pill when you would have been just as happy with a hug? We want understanding. I had a secretary that was sick for the longest time with bronchitis, pneumonia. They couldn't figure it out. She was in and out of hospital. She came out, and, and one day I, I walked in the office. She's smiling, and I said, Louise, you're happy. What? And she goes, I finally got a diagnosis. And I was going, fantastic. What do you have? And she said, I have idiopathic pulmonary disease. And I kept my mouth, I just kept smiling because she doesn't know. Idiopathic means we have no idea. Pulmonary means it's in the lungs. Idiopathic means 
We have no idea where it came from or what it is. But because the doctors paid her attention and gave it a name, it mattered to her. What helped her there, science or relationship? Relationship. That's why I always tell people, love, my only evangelism ploy is love them till they ask you why. And then you can talk to them about Jesus. So, let's, um, let's, let's go to the, what we're supposed to talk about tonight. Is the Bible bad? Darwin, uh, I'm sorry, Dark, uh, Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, thinks the Bible is a very strange book. He says he is not impressed by it at all. Sam Harris says it is actually an evil book and should be completely banished. So does Chris Hitchens, or he did. He's passed on now. Daniel Dennett seen several serious problems with God in his book. He says the biblical God is cruel. The biblical God has nothing to teach enlightened society about right and wrong. I always like that when somebody claims that they're the enlightened one. That's, that's helpful. The Bible presents women as property. And quote, the Bible is not even coherent, but a chaotically cobbled together anthology of disjoined documents. So, how do they prove this? Well, Dawkins goes for pretty much where you'd expect. Sodom, you know, the horrible rape of a concubine and... Judges 19 through 21, he keeps going to things like that. But strangely, he never asks one question. See, one of our problems in life is we don't ask enough questions. And he didn't ask the right question. He never asked if God approves of any of the things he's mentioning. Did God approve of what was going on in Sodom? Did God approve of the rape and murder of the concubine? Did God approve of the sacrifice of the man's daughter when he comes home from battle? Dawkins thinks the stories are repugnant, so he thinks God's repugnant. But that'd be like blaming Darwin for the shapes of birds' beaks. Darwin just described them. He didn't cause it. A lot of the Bible is description, not proscription or prescription. It's not God saying, this is what I want to happen. He's saying, this is what happened. And the evil is supposed to make us shudder. And by the way, Dawkins never gives the authors any credit for reporting the evil. If I was writing the Bible, I wouldn't put that in. Would you put the rape of Tamar in? Story of Dinah? Any of that? Nope, not me either. Jesus came and everything was lovely and the apostles were perfect. The end. Go do that likewise. Get busy. Uh, Learn this phrase. Observation is not causation. And a lot of the Bible is observation of the evil of man. In fact, some of the Bible says things that God doesn't agree with. For example, David calls himself a worm. God never calls us a worm. There's the old hymn, At the Cross, At the Cross, has a line in it. Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Most new versions put for such a one as I. And I'm glad they do, because I'm not a worm. In fact, as a boy, I looked at my dad and said, I can't sing that song. God doesn't call me a worm. And my dad looked at it and he says, you're right. That was about the only time he ever did, but there it was. <laughs> I alerted the media to let them know. He never thinks to include, Dawkins doesn't, to include the last verse of Judges that says, in those days, Israel and Israel, there was no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes, explaining why everything was so awful. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes, Dr. Dawkins. They considered themselves bright. Dawkins misses the point. He mistakes narrative for editorial. All right? For example, many of you may have missed the news before you came. France is in a lot of pain tonight. Um, The last number I heard was 60 dead in an attack in Nice. Over 100 injured. These are early numbers, so don't hold anybody to them. They are trying to clean up the mess. And Nice is one of the most beautiful places on the planet, by the way. And to have this happen right on that seaboard lane is is just shocking in the main. It's shocking. Now, I just told you that story. Did I approve of what happened? No. Did I cause it? No. Dawkins can't understand this. So when God tells us a story, he assumes approval and causation. But editorial is not 
Now, observation is not causation, and narrative is not editorial. For example, Dawkins calls the uh, Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac a horrendous act of child abuse. He fails to see that God, in no uncertain terms, showed Abraham, we don't do that. We stop it. By the way, on that mountain where that happened, later on they would build a city called Jerusalem on that mountain. And Jesus, uh, the God's son, would die on that mountain, but not Abraham's son. Abraham and all of Israel learned, we don't kill our sons. By the way, I've seen the paintings, and it's always a young boy there, terrified and the like. And when I was a boy, that terrified me as well. But when you talk to rabbis, they say the word used for Isaac at that time would have put him closer to 30. Now, if you've got a 30-year-old still living in your tent, you don't mind going to the mountain with him, you know, (laughs) saying. uh, But anyway, regardless, he fails to see that Dawkins fails to see that the Old Testament rails against the abuse of children. In fact, the new atheists make a point of missing all of the scriptures in the Old Testament about taking care of the needy, taking care of the foreigner, taking care of women, children. They don't see that God frequently appeared to women, such as Hagar, to women tossed out, thrown away, and rescued them, and took care of them, and treated them as people. Hagar, I love what she says. She says, I have seen the God who sees me. In a world that did not look at slave women, Almighty God stopped and saw her and made provision for her. There are so many other passages we could go to. Uh, Psalm 72 has like four different ones in it. Uh, Micah uh, chapter 6 and verses 6 and 7 have that as well, where God cares about the foreigners, the children, and the women. Jesus, in fact... Count up his compliments. Where did they go? Almost no guy got them. But women did in public, even foreign women. And all of that was against their rules at that time. But God didn't care. He treated women with such respect. C.S. Lewis put it this way. It is hard to look. It is hard to see something above you when you're in the habit of looking down your nose at things. Dawkins has even gone so far as to say that no description of human beings written before 1849 means anything because Dawkins has a god named Darwin. If you don't doubt it, read his stuff or watch the movie Expelled. Remember that from several years ago? And just watch his face, Dawkins' face, as he stands in front of the statue of Charles Darwin. There's worship there. He misses, therefore, everything nice that God said about human beings in the Bible. Because his God starts in 1849. What's the alternative? Is the Bible bad? What's the alternative? Well, we used to say that everybody was born knowing right and wrong as they grew up. They understood right and wrong. We called it natural law. And that has ruled through the centuries until in America... It died during the, the Judge Robert Bork hearings for the Supreme Court when Ted Kennedy and Joseph, Joe Biden led an onslaught against him, attacking him for believing that human beings are born good, knowing right and wrong. We'd always said that before. But now, that'll get you kicked off the Supreme Court. It will not let you on it. We believe, in fact, that people should know better. Don't you? Haven't you said that? They shouldn't cut in line. They shouldn't steal other people's stuff. We say that people that have submerged that kind of knowledge are sociopathic. In fact, I'll ask atheists, should you wait out to save a drowning child? And they'll say, yes. I say, good, good. And by the way, I don't doubt them. I don't meet very many mean atheists. I'm, I'm sure they're there. I meet mean Christians, too. Uh, So, you know, we're not slamming atheists here. We're just saying even they will go out to save a drowning child. And I'll say, why? One man said, it's because we're moral and we don't need a holy book to be moral. Okay. What if the observer just saw the drowning child as another mistake of evolution? 
Survival of the fittest. Is that acceptable? What if they're an unnecessary thing? Rather like your appendix, it's necessary. But they, anyway. What if saving the child was an annoyance and you had brand new, pretty expensive shoes on? What if it will make you late for a very important appointment? It's hard to see how evolution makes an argument to save the child. We are under obligation to save the child. If we were in Nice, France tonight, it would be required of us to go from person to person offering aid and comfort without asking them, do you believe in God? Are you Church of Christ or Baptist or Pentecostal? Or do you believe? No, it is required of us. An atheist will say, well, we do the same thing. And I'll say, can you show me the hospitals atheists have built? We'll have a St. Thomas Hospital or a Baptist Hospital. But where's the Darwin Hospital? Where's the Dawkins Hospital? Where's the we don't believe in any God Hospital? You, you know, where are the hospitals that treat people for free? St. Jude, Shriners, all based in faith. Where are the, who, who builds the orphanages? Who designs aid programs? Who's the one that funds Compassion International, Doctors Without Borders, um, Oh, there are so many. I would leave them out if I tried. Who are the ones that fund these out of their own pockets? And which group doesn't fund them and just says, well, we pay taxes for that? Christians give. Christians step up. Every time. Every single time. In atheist societies, we find if a society is atheistic, and you need to watch it because it's already that way in Breton, in America, the largest voting block in this election for the first time is no religion. That's the largest voting block. It's, it's, You've you got to watch it. In atheistic societies, we find wanton disregard for human life. USSR, Albania, you know, um, Pol Pot's regime in Cambodia. We could go on and on. And I'll even go further. In societies where Christianity is not the top religion, you find want and disregard for human life. Look at the Muslim countries that we are seeing. Look at India, where children that are begging on the street are ignored because their doctrine teaches if you know, they're, they're suffering for something they did in prior life. And they have to work through that. If you feed them and take care of it, they'll just have to be born through this all over again. It's the Christians that go there and feed them. Not the Hindus, not the Muslims, not the Buddhists. The Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. And then the word neighbor is defined by God to mean everyone, especially your enemies. The story of the Good Samaritan. We don't realize how hard that was for them to hear. Justin said he talked to my son-in-law, Josh Graves, today. Josh Graves preaches for the Otter Creek Church of Christ, which is also instrumental and also a a loving group, about 10 miles away from my church building. And we're sister congregations. It's a much larger one. We're about 700-something. He's, I think, 1,600 or something up there. Wonderful, wonderful church. But he wrote a book which has caused some real ripples. The title of the book, he's written a few, but this book is called How Not to Kill a Muslim. Now, his brother-in-law, my son, is a Marine. Not just a Marine, an 0311. He is a door-kicking, rifle squad-leading Marine. Josh's other cousin on the other side, he's got my, my son's a brother-in-law, cousin in his own family is an Army Ranger. And his brother-in-law on his family is a colonel in the National Guard, very frequently overseas. All of those men approve this book because it's not about we shouldn't go to war. It's about how can we talk to them now so that we don't have to fight them later? How can we bridge this gap? And he uses the sermon of Jesus on the Good Samaritan because you cannot understand how much they hated Samaritans. They hated Samaritans. Samaritans were worse than Romans, worse than Greeks, 
worse than pagans. They were worse than everybody. And Jesus said that Samaritan was a better neighbor, loved him more, and showed God more than your own priest did. That's shocking. But perhaps it shouldn't be. This country, I want to give you your due here. You know, we have 300 years military service in our family, um, but it's mainly been British until recently. Um, the American military takes better care of the enemy on the battlefield than any other military, period. Your medics will crawl through fire to save a wounded enemy. That's just, other countries don't understand that. They'll look at that and go, why? Just put another bullet in them and save your medic. You guys have rules. about and People that went to Guantanamo gained weight and got healthier. They're having it better there than they've ever had it. Why? Because of the way your country was set up. It was set up to be a country for moral people. Please remember that John Adams, uh, Benjamin Franklin, all of them warned you that this is a republic and it's very fragile and you'll lose it if you are no longer a moral Christian people. Now to them, you didn't have to go to church to be Christian. You just had to have certain precepts. Some of them didn't go to church at all. And so I'm always a little cautious when people say our founding fathers were Christian. And in a way, some of them were. Benjamin Franklin Slept around, did a lot of weird things. Uh, so let's not get too excited. But the point is, it was all based on, we're going to build our society on that of Moses. The rules in Amos chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 2, Matthew chapter 5, that said, care for all nations, love people of all races everywhere. In fact, the most consistent theme in Jesus' teaching is to tear down walls between people. Whereas evolution teaches that some people are brighter than others, some people are more valuable than others, some people are more, if you heard this phrase, highly evolved than others. In Christianity, we're brothers and sisters. I did a big event for some Methodists in Ohio uh, last month, and it was, it was really interesting to me because you know, these, these Methodist pastors were amazing to me and uh, worked hard, but at the end of it, they gave me my check. And on my way home, I called my wife and I said, I might become a Methodist. And she said, why? And I said, because of the check they gave me. And she said, was it that big? I said, no, the check was normal. But when they put my name there, it was to the right Reverend Dr. Patrick Mead. And I said, it's about time. <laughs> well... I don't mind if somebody's called the right reverend doctor. Don't, don't, please don't misunderstand me. But what I love about Christianity is no matter what your titles are, we're all brothers and sisters before God. I love that. How did Dawkins miss that? I'll tell you how. How did Harris miss it? They haven't read. They are judging what they don't know. They are the kid at dinner who when faced with a the food they've not seen before, because I don't like it. Well, you've never had it. Nope. How do you know you don't like it? I just know. Then they grow up to become Richard Dawkins. <laughs> Even Robert Funk, the founder of the Jesus Seminar, who's not a believer, said that all through the Gospels, quote, Jesus privileged, that's an odd use of the verb, privileged the poor, sick, infirm women, children, tax collectors, and foreigners. In a society ordered by a purity system, the inclusiveness of Jesus' movement embodied a radically alternative social vision. How did Dawkins miss that? Because he wants to miss it. Funk goes on, and again, he was not a believer. But writing, he was a huge Jesus admirer. Jesus was socially promiscuous. Oh, I've got to stop there. Because when you hear the word promiscuous, you generally think sleeping around. No, what this means, socially promiscuous means he would fellowship anybody. He ate and drank publicly with petty tax officials and singers, yet did not refuse dinner with the learned and wealthy. He was seen in the company of women in public, an occasion for scandal in his society. 
He included children in his social circle and advised that God's domain is filled with them. In fact, of all the world's religions, there are only two that teach unity among all races. One is Confucians, Confucius, Confucianism. The other is Christianity. All of the others teach about walls between races. We do not. The Nazis knew this. That's why they burned Bibles years before they burned people. They had to get rid of the Bibles first. What about Jesus and women? Dawkins says that Jesus is misogynistic and God hates women. Really? In the Old Testament, women acted as songwriters, worship leaders, prophets, and queens. They took the initiative for good or ill. Some of them weren't good women, but most of them were. Two Old Testament books bear the names of women, and both are strong women. Esther was no fainting flower, neither was Ruth. The Song of Solomon is very frank in its description of uh, sexuality and has both a man and a woman taking the initiative. It's a book about sex. I was speaking at the University of Michigan to a group of non-believers. They, they wanted a believer to come in for three days. Actually, they were the LGBT community up there. And they wanted for three days to, to grill a Christian. And my friend gave them my name. So I went. I'm not afraid to see Jesus, so I went. I walked in, looked at him, and I said, what? They were not expecting that. They were expecting a formal statement and a straw or lines. I said, what? I said, take your best shot. What are your, what are your objections? And we did that for the first day. That was a hoot. That was fun. One lady stood up, and she said, uh, Christians are against sex. I said, no, we're not. She said, yes, you are. I said, no, we're not. And we did that for a while because I'm paid by the hour, and I got time. Finally, she, she paused for a minute, and I said, I work for the guy that invented sex. She had never thought of that. And I said, in fact, he wrote a whole book and a Bible about it. And I tell you that because I later was at a Christian university, and I told that story, and it offended a few people. And they came up to me, and I could tell they were preachers because they were wearing three-piece polyester sh- uh, suits. I mean, really, people, you could grab them, rub them on a carpet, stick them on a wall. They were... They were... Anyway... And they came up to me and they said, uh, Dr. Mead, the book of Song of Solomon is not about sex. It's an allegory of Christ's love for the church. And I laughed so hard, I almost pulled a muscle. I said, no, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Everything in an allegory has to have a strict corollary for everything being allegorized. So when he's drinking out of her belly button, is that like elder selection or what? How do I... And, and that... Come to think of it, I've not been invited back to that one, but... Um, <laughs> By the way, if some of you did not know this about the Song of Solomon and are very excited to go read it, read it, enjoy it, but please be aware the compliments are, they pass their sell-by date, all right? So when you look at a woman now and say, your hair looks like a bunch of goats coming off the mountain, it's not a positive. (laughs) Or your nose looks like Mount Hermon, they liked that back then. Or that your teeth look like little sheep, he just meant you had a lot of them. You still have your teeth. You know, just don't, don't use the compliments. But Song of Solomon has strong woman. The book of Proverbs ends with a remarkable woman who's industrious, creative, and wise, but it personifies wisdom as a woman. Sophia. And by the way, in no Dawkins books, not one of them, does the Old Testament get one citation in a bibliography. He is criticizing something he doesn't know. But he's certain he knows. Just like the kid, I know I don't like it. In the New Testament, by the way, women are said to have rights in the marriage. Women and men are not allowed to deny them their rights. He tells men to give up their lives for their wives. And every single, every single encounter with women in the gospel Jesus violated the mores of his time by showing them public respect, public adoration, public care, and dignity. His behavior toward women was absolutely without parallel in all civilized societies since the rise of patriarchy, and that 
has missed, that the, the, the Darwinists don't understand that at all. It was Jesus. In fact, look at a nation where Jesus has not gone. What are the state of women and children? Then look at a nation where Jesus has gone. Women and children are safer, protected by law, respected. Jesus' teachings are the cure, not the disease. Dawkins rails against believing the Gospels. He said they weren't written down for 50 to 70 years after the event. Well, it may be true. Hard to say. But even if it were true, why do you think they, what, most of what they contain is not true? Most of us have memories that are decades old by now. I'm 59. I remember stuff. I can tell you about stuff. On the way up here, I stopped and went to Rosine, to the birthplace of um, Bill Monroe, because I'm a music guy, and I like to collect music, and bluegrass is one of the musics that I learned first when I had, had my, uh, started playing guitar. Uh, I played it on a 12-string. I didn't know you weren't allowed to, um, but I did, and I, I learned other stuff there, too, but I, I really enjoyed that. Just recently read a biography of him, so I thought, you know, that's just, off. no GPS knows where it is. I was sent everywhere. Eventually found it by accident, drove up to it, and standing in front of it was an old lady. Uh, and, and when I say old lady, I'm not being disrespectful. I'm an old guy. Uh, but she even introduced herself as an old lady. I walked up, or I got out. She walked up to me and put her, uh, her hands on me. Now, I'm Scottish. We, we don't even hug our wives and, you know, without an appointment. And, <laughs> and so she put her, her, her hands on my shoulders, and she looked at me, and she goes... In 12 days, I'm going to be 80 years old. I have, I have no idea who this person is. I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, and I've, I've been off work for two weeks because I had the tick disease. I went, okay. And she said, they tell me the last thing to come back is my memory. I went, I'm with you. And she said, so I'm going to give you the tour. But whenever I stop, because I can't remember something, you just wait on me. And I went, yes, ma'am. Now, I, I, I was actually just planning to spend like 20 minutes. It was two hours because she had things to say. And it was, it was I, could, I, could go, I, I went over all this with my wife last night, and she was almost in the floor laughing. There was so much, and, and it was a really, you got to go. You got to go. And make sure Jonelle Patterson is your guide. I'm not sure she ever leaves, so she's probably it. But she was a delight. I would adopt her tomorrow. Anyway, she was uh, a childhood friend of the Monroe boys. In fact, she even turned to me and she goes, I liked Charlie Best. Didn't you like Charlie Best? And I went, I never, never met him. And she goes, well, you've heard his music. And I went, well, a, a, a couple of bits. Well, didn't you like him best? And I'm going, I really don't want to, you know, choose a side. Uh, but she could remember and she understood and she told the stories. Now, did I drive away going, it's probably not true. Stuff happened 50 years ago. She can't remember stuff like that. You remember, don't you? So you write it down. Besides, if it's important to you, don't you tell other people? And they can write it down. Of course, that's why I read a biography of Bill Monroe, not an autobiography. Other people heard of things. They wrote them down. Most of us have memories. We can handle that. By the way, none of the New Atheist holds any other text to that same standard. They will, they will believe Bede's History of England. They will believe all these other texts, uh, Caesar's Gallic Wars, all of this, which have no closeness to the events at all. The Gospels sound like eyewitness accounts because they are. And we're going to talk quite a bit about that tomorrow when we talk about the resurrection. Dawkins says, the four evangelists never met Jesus. How, how does he know that? He wasn't there. Two of the writers explicitly say they did. So, you know, Luke probably got most of his information from Mary, by the way, because he is the only one of the writers that brings up things Mary thought in her heart about certain things. So he probably got, you know, mom knows. Mark wrote down the words and sermons of Peter. So he wrote down the words of an eyewitness. The other two claimed they were eyewitnesses. Uh, Dawkins may wish it otherwise, but he has no evidence. 
So he makes blanket statements, and guess what? People say, a scientist said it, that must be true. You need just to ask him questions. How do you think he, knew, he knows that? What was his evidence? What did he offer as evidence? And they'll get real quiet because there's no evidence. Dawkins runs to anywhere he can. He'll say, they copy ancient myths. No, not really. One of my favorite ones is whenever they'll say, you know that flood story in the Bible? That's an ancient myth. That comes from, the, there were other flood stories all over the world. All right, let me get you right then. If it was only the Bible that told the flood story, you wouldn't believe it. Because you'd say, if there was a flood, there would be other people talking about it. But since everybody talks about it, you don't believe it. (laughs) That doesn't work. It's not scientific. Well, I just want to do this real quick here. Sam Harris writes an entire book about Christians and faith causing war. He didn't do any checking on that. Uh, last year, for what, which figures are available, hate crimes. They'll say hate crimes, you know, murders. It's all about, about Jesus and Christianity and Islam. Really? Okay, hang on. Last year, for which figures are available, there were 848 anti-Jewish hate crimes. 128 hate crimes against Muslims. 58 were against Catholic. 57 were against Protestant. 39 were against multiple religions. And only four were against atheists. Yet he claims atheists are a persecuted group. While he lives in a multi-million dollar home and gets the adoration of the world. I'm going, let's not yell Holocaust just yet, Richard. Besides... Have you ever been to, um, have you ever looked at the Encyclopedia of Wars? There's an Encyclopedia of Wars. It has every war ever known in the history of mankind, constantly updated, sadly. How many of those had anything to do with religion? Well, there were 1,763 wars in the history of mankind. Of those, 1,763, of those 123 had any religious component at all. And two-thirds of those were Muslim. Why are you picking on Christians? By the way, he never picks on Muslims. I think it's because Muslims pick back. We have to love them. Muslims, not so much. There is a religious component to less than 7% of all wars. I'll put it to you a different way. There have been 600, 671,000 Americans killed in all wars since the founding of America. 671,000. Which of those wars were based on religion? None. They were all based on politics or international politics. You could try to say civil war. Nah, it's not going to get you there. There were Christians on both sides of that. The fact is, the new atheists don't know our God. And you know what? There's no reason for them to ever know our God if that's the God they think exists. The only way they're going to know a different God exists is to see it. Gandhi wrote that he loved Christ. He respected Christ. He said, but he didn't like Christians because they're not like Christ. I've come across several writings from Gandhi and others that said Christianity is a wonderful idea. It's a shame nobody's tried it. So we're not doing our job. We need to love to the point where there's no other reason but God. And it gets them interested And checking him out. If you have any questions tonight, first of all, I'm glad the air conditioning is working better, but it's still hot, right? And you guys have been incredibly patient to be sitting in these wee chairs. That's the only reason I became a minister is because I didn't want to sit. I knew I had to go to church, but. All right, tomorrow we're going to focus on the resurrection. Does it make sense historically, logically, and yeah, even scientifically?
All right? Should be fun. Thanks for letting me play. Cheers. Do you want... Is this good? Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, you know, I, I think about how to have these conversations a whole lot, and I'll give you some some information. Of course, there's a, there's a tons of tons of stuff on there uh, out there, reading material and books you can get. I have a lot of my favorite apologists where you can find answers to these tough questions that maybe you're afraid to answer for people, or maybe that you're afraid to deal with it. There's a lot of that stuff out there. There's one really good one by a guy named Gregory Kokel. It's just called tactics. And what Gregory does, he does, he's not giving you the answers to the questions, but he's teaching you how to have the conversations. And it's been a really, really important book. And one of the things I got from it the most is the, the burden of proof. Um, a lot of things that get said to you from, from the non-believing community and from other religions, or really from the non-believing community, is, hey, you say that God exists, the burden of proof is on you, but the person that makes the claim is taking the burden of proof on their self, so they're, they're letting you ask the questions. And when Patrick talks about, hey, just ask questions, if they make the claim, let them defend their position. And, of course, we do it with love and respect because there's two things that we in the non-believing world have to agree on. One is that there was something that always existed. That's the cause for everything that we know. Uh, the non-believing people will believe that at least there was some sort of stuff that blew up and made everything. We believe that a God, in a God that always existed, that created everything. Another thing that we, we share in common, which is always good to find common ground when you're having these discussions, is that people are responsible for all the evil in the world. And that's a big talking point. That's one that really hits home with everybody. That we have to, you know, we agree that through sin and then in the garden and in that way, they have to believe, since they don't believe in God and sin and Satan and that sort of thing, that they have to believe that people are responsible for all evil. So those are two things that you have in common where you can talk and you can find things that you agree on. And of course, we always love. So let me close this in prayer and then we're going to get out of here. And I'll see you tomorrow. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I thank you so much for everybody in this room and I thank you so much for the people that don't believe in you that you've placed in our lives. Lord, I apologize for when um, we failed to love them like you love them. And Lord, I just ask for your, uh, your wisdom and your eyes to see them the way that you see them. Uh, God, I just ask that you would protect us as we go home and that you would be with us and our families and be with the people that are on our minds and their families as they sleep tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.